You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asira to Nabawiya. In the last couple of sessions, we've actually been talking about the Hijra to from Mecca, Mecca to Mukarrama, uh, to Al Madina to Munawwara. We've been talking about the the great migration of not just the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but of all the Muslims from Mecca to Medina, and the settling of the community in Medina, and what a monumentous occasion, and what uh, a landmark event that actually was. In the course of talking about that, we've covered a few different things. We spent uh, some time discussing the migration of key members of the community, very stories that really, really stick out and um, have been a core part of you know, the prophetic tradition in this regard when we talk about the seerah, such as the story of the family, Abu Salama, Ummu Salama and their son. We talked about the hijrah, the migration of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and we talked about a lot of different uh, incidents and different uh, events that occurred. In the previous session, we were actually talking about the, the day that Yawm zahma the day that the kuffar of, the, of Quraysh gathered together, created a council, and they met in regards to, they, they were trying to figure out how to handle this situation that was going on. That all the Muslims are leaving, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will soon, might also leave. What should we do? How do we go about in handling this situation? And one of the things that we talked about was how they, they, they basically shared different thoughts and ideas and opinions. Shaitan himself, who was present in that particular meeting in the form of a very old man, presented the proposition, uh, kept re- turning down everything that they were saying, until finally Abu Jahl presents the proposition of assassinating the Prophet ﷺ in a very specific form, where you gather together young men of all the different families and tribes of Quraysh, and everybody kills him or assassinates him, attacks him at the same time, but thereby, you know, Banu Hashim not really being able to seek retribution from any one family, and that settling the matter. So they gather on to this, they lay, they lay siege to the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is informed of what is going on by Jibreel alayhi salam and told to immediately depart. He calls Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, puts him into position, gives him the instructions on how to distribute all the um, amanat, everything that he was safekeeping for people. And then the Prophet ﷺ departs. And we talked about that miraculous incident where the Prophet ﷺ passes through the midst of these people. He actually hears Abu Jahl talking about him and he goes outside and he says, yes, I am the one who said, Abu Jahl saying that he calls you to worship one God and leave the idols. And he says, if you listen to him, you'll get paradise and this. He gives like a whole khutbah Abu Jahl does. And the Prophet ﷺ goes outside and he says, na'am, ana aqul dhalik. Yeah, that's exactly what I say. And then the Prophet ﷺ scoops up a handful of dirt, recites the ayat of Surah Yasin, and throws the dirt. And the narration says a little bit of dirt, dust lands on the head of every person there. And the Prophet ﷺ passes clear through them without them noticing. And eventually somebody else comes to them and says, well, what are you doing here? They say, waiting for Muhammad wasallam." And the man says that, well, he's long gone. Didn't you see? He just walked right through here. And he said, what are you talking about? He's sleeping inside. Because Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is sleeping in the bed of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So they want two narrations. One is that they wait till the morning time. Another narration is that they start to kind of panic a little bit. They barge into the home and they find Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu sleeping there. And they say, you know, it's, it's problematic. It's tough enough to try to kill one member of Banu Hashim. We can't just randomly kill another person. So they leave Ali. They ask him, where is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? says, you know, uh, he's gone, he's long gone. And so they leave Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, 
And at this point in time, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we we ended the narration. We ended the session talking about Ali radiallahu taala anhu and his story of the hijrah and the migration, where he eventually leaves after taking care of all the affairs, wrapping up everything in Mecca, and he leaves and how he arrives there finally in Medina, and he's very ill. His feet are in very bad shape, and then again the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam performs this miracle of you know remedying Ali radiallahu. Allahu ta'ala anhu with his bare hands and his saliva and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is miraculously cured now we pick up from this moment so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam leaves his home and he heads directly for Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu's home when i was reading and preparing and researching for tonight's session i couldn't help but notice that the next the, the next few things that occur in this journey of the hijra the next few details that we come across in the hijra and the migration all involve the remarkable Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and his amazing family Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and specifically his daughter Asma bin Abi Bakr that the following events all point towards how unbelievably amazing they were what an amazing remarkable man abu bakr as-siddiq radiyallahu anhu was and so i i kind of realized to really do justice cuz uh, the brothers and sisters who normally attend the sira class or listen to the podcast afterwards they know that you know the objective here has always been quality over quantity um that i don't try to rush through the events but i try to take each event and really understand it and analyze it and appreciate it and then extract and draw the lessons from there so i realized again that even if we tonight are only able to get from the house of abu bakr to the cave of uh, to the ghar of uh to the ghar of thawr that even if we're only able to get from the house of Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu to the cave of Thawr that's completely worth it and i realized that the theme overall of tonight's session would just be the virtues the fadail the manaqib the virtues the remarkable facts about this amazing man Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu may allah be pleased with him and i want to go ahead and start with a narration that is mentioned there are a couple of different versions of this narration this particular version is narrated uh by Imam Az-Zuhri uh who narrates it from Urwa Urwa ibn Zubair who was the nephew of Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha and also one of her students and he narrates it from the mother of the believers his aunt his teacher Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha she says qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger of god may pe- may allah's peace and blessings be upon him said ma ahadun amannu alayya fi suhbatihi wa dhat yadihi min abi bakr the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that no one has ever done more for me either through his companionship or by means of the support that that person has provided for me nobody nobody has ever done more for me then Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes on to say ma nafa'ani malun ma nafa'ani malu Abi Bakr No one's wealth was more beneficial in the cause of the deen when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says it did not benefit me what what does that mean not buying the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam luxurious things even though Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu would do that if that's what was asked of him or required of him but that's not what he's referring to he's referring helping the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is helping the deen of Allah Because that was the cause that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lived for. He woke up every morning, he went to sleep every night, he lived, he breathed, he walked, he talked, the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So he says, no one's wealth has ever benefited the deen as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. وَلَوْ كُنْتُ مُتَّخِذًا خَلِيلًا لَتَّخَطُ أَبَا بَكْرٍ خَلِيلًا And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that if I was to take a best friend, because in another narration, In another place the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that I have taken Allah as my best friend. I have taken Allah as my best best friend. Khalil is like your absolute most bestest friend. So he says that I have taken Allah as my best friend. But if I was to take a human being as my best friend, it would have been Abu Bakr radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. 
I shared this earlier because we've already actually once before talked about the virtue of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the early seerah or actually quite some time back when we talked about him being one of the first people to accept Islam. That the Prophet ﷺ said, every single person, all of you, one time in Medina, he's addressing the Muslims, later on in Medina, he says, all of you, when I gave you the message, when I preached to you, when I shared the message with you, you thought about it, you asked a question, you slept on it, you came back the next day, etc., etc. He says, all except for Abu Bakr. I told him the message, he immediately accepted. No questions asked. Then we again talked about the virtues of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the story of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu has no humanly, like if we talk about it from a non-Islamic, non-spiritual perspective, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu has no human, uh, it's not humanly possible for him to actually know what the Prophet sallallahu is saying is actual fact. The Prophet sallallahu is describing Al-Bayt al-Maqdis, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, He's describing Jerusalem. And he's describing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. And as the Prophet ﷺ is describing every little detail, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it in front of his eyes, he can see it and he's describing it. Every single sentence the Prophet ﷺ completes, its door is here, its window is like this, the door is like this, the musalla looks like this. Everything he describes at the end of every statement, like a period. Like a period, punctuation mark. At the end of every single statement, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala says, Sadaqta, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah, Sadaqta. You have spoken the truth, you have spoken the truth, you have spoken the truth. So this is that great man Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And we read the narration, the Prophet sallallahu own testimony about the great virtue of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and what service he provided for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want us to understand, even before, usually I try to share some of the lessons and the take home message at the end of the day. I, I'd like to share something here at the outset. Because when we listen to what we're about to talk about, I don't want anyone to be in the mindset of, we're listening to a story from a long, long time ago, in a faraway place, there was a man. That's a fairy tale. But we're not talking fairy tales here. I want us to be able to understand what we're exactly talking about. This is a man that we owe our deen to. This is a man who left a legacy. This was the man who was at the aid of the Prophet ﷺ. This is a man who at every turn, every single time the deen needed somebody, the Prophet ﷺ needed somebody to stand up and support, it was Abu Bakr ta'ala who answered the call. This is a man that we personally, you and I, all of us, we are indebted to. And to, for us to not know about him, and to not appreciate him, and not make dua for him, and pray for him, and look forward to meet him in paradise on the day of judgment in the hereafter, it's a tragedy on our part. It's an ignorance of our history. When you talk about the history of any nation, any country, there's so much adulation and admiration of individuals, the founder of a country, the first president of a nation, the liberator of a people, the leader of the army that won the revolution. We idolize these people. And oftentimes, subhanAllah, the, the really interesting thing is a hundred years, two hundred years later, we have revisionist history. And when we go back and we actually find out that a lot of times they were kind of terrible people. True or not? We find out 200 years later, well, this guy had a plantation full of slaves. A'udhu billah. And here we, 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 we idolize this man. We go, we look back 600 years later, 700 years later, we find out this person in, was enslaving people, free people, enslaving them and selling them as slaves halfway across the world. And we, 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 we idolize this person? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man of the highest standard. How can we not know about him? One of the people that laid the foundation of this religion. This is that great man. Before we even read this, I want you to keep one statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala in mind. Everything you hear about him, everything you learn about him, I want you to keep one statement that he made later on in his life. He actually made the statement after the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He made one statement that really summarizes who Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala was. He said, Ayan qusudinu wa ana hay. He said, can the deen suffer any level of decrease? Can the religion, 
like suffer any, can the religion suffer any type of a setback while I am still alive? That either I die preventing from the religion from suffering any type of a setback, or I need to exert every ounce of my being to ensure that there is no setback here. It's one or the other. So this is the mindset of this man. Keep that in mind. So now we read about the narration. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his Musnad mentions in a narration from Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah there's, I'll share the narration with you that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Bukhari actually first he says Bu'ithan Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li arba'ina sanatan The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was made a Prophet at the age of 40 like he was given revelation فَمَكَثَ بِمَكَثَ ثَلَاثَ عَشَرَ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ then he, li- then he spent 13 years in Mecca while receiving revelation ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِالْهِجْرَةِ فَهَاجَرَ عَشْرَ سِنِينَ Then he was commanded to migrate from Mecca to Medina and he lived there for 10 years. وَمَاتَ وَهُوَ إِبْنُ ثَلَاثٍ وَسِتِينَ And he passed away when he was 63 years old. وَقَدْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فِي شَهْرِ رَبِيعِ الْأَوَّلْ سَنَةَ ثَلَاثَ عَشْرَ مِنْ بِعَثَتِهِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ That his migration from Mecca to Medina was in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. In the thirteenth year of his prophethood, his message, his mission, وَذَلِكَ فِي يَوْمِ الْإِثْنَيْنِ And that was on the day of Monday. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullahu ta'ala, as I was mentioning earlier, mentions from Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, أَنَّهُ قَالْ وُلِدَ نَبِيُّكُمْ يَوْمِ الْإِثْنَيْنِ That your messenger and your prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, was born on a Monday. وَخَرَجْ مِنْ مَكَّةَ يَوْمِ الْإِثْنَيْنِ And he was, um, he left Mecca, meaning he departed on the journey of the Hijrah on a Monday. He was made a prophet on a Monday, like he received revelation on Monday. He entered into Al Madinatul Munawwara on a Monday. And he passed away on a Monday. And this narration is authenticated. It's an authentic narration that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal mentions in his Musnad. So I just want to kind of mark the, the day. And the scholars agree, there was actually an ijma' of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum during the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the beginning of the Islamic calendar was from that day uh, of Monday that the Prophet wasallam departed from Mecca to al-Mukarramah on the journey of the Hijrah. That was the beginning of the Islamic calendar. And since that's from where we mark the years, the Hijrah years, uh, the Islamic calendar. And as we talked about in the previous session, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala had constantly been going, uh, very interestingly, kind of hinting towards the fact, asking the Prophet ﷺ for permission to migrate. And he was doing it almost with the intention of trying to see when the Prophet ﷺ would be leaving. And the Prophet ﷺ kept telling him, لا تعجل يا أبا بكر لا تعجل. He said, "Don't rush, O Abu Bakr. لا على الله لا على الله أن يجعل لك صاحبا." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, I'm very hopeful that Allah will give you, provide you a companion on your journey. And he was referring to himself. إنما يعني نفسه. So what Abu Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنه did during this time was he spent 800 darahim. He spent 800 darahim, and he went out and he purchased two camels. He purchased two camels and he had purchased them. He purchased the, all the materials that were necessary for the travel, for the journey. And he had taken these two camels and he had given them to uh, a servant, a slave, to basically safe keep and safeguard and hold on to them and keep feeding them and making sure that they were okay. And be basically on call, be on notice. He hired him and told him, keep them ready, keep them gassed up and oiled up and ready. And the second I give you the word, I won't have a lot of time. It might be all of a sudden. But the second I give you the word, I need you to immediately bring those camels to me. So the narration goes on to mention, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, كَانَ لَا يُخْتِئُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَنْ يَأْتِيَ بَيْتَ أَبِي بَكَرْ أَحَدَ طَرْفَيَيْ النَّهَارِ إِمَّا بُكْرَةً وَإِمَّا عَشِيَةً She says that the Prophet ﷺ would visit the home of Abu Bakr anhu every single day. Every day he would come and visit his friend Abu Bakr anhu. And that was the companionship, the love, the connection, the trust 
that the Prophet ﷺ had in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And she said he would either come in the morning or he'd come in the evening. The day that the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah to make the hijrah, the migration, he came, um, you know, at a time where he normally wouldn't come. And atana Rasulullah ﷺ bil hajira fi sa'atin kana la yati fiha. It was like in the evening time, and the Prophet ﷺ typically wouldn't come at this time. He'd come a little bit earlier in the day, like towards, you know, before the sun set, or he'd come after the sun had risen. Those were the normal times. And he came a little bit more like in the night time, when it was dark outside. And that was not the habit of the Prophet ﷺ. So she says that in, as soon as the Prophet, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw the Prophet ﷺ at the door, he knew something was up. He knew something was up. مَا جَاءَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ هَذِهِ السَّاعَةَ إِلَّا لِأَمْرٍ قَدْ حَدَثْ He's come here for a reason, something's happened. So the Prophet ﷺ comes inside, Abu Bakr ta'ala who tells him to have a seat. He looks around and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says the only people in the home at that time was the father, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and his two daughters, Asma bint Abi Bakr and Aisha as siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha. These were the only members of the family that were in the house at that time. The Prophet ﷺ sat down, he looked around, he saw all three of us, and then he told Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that if there is anyone else in the home, I need you to kind of ask them to leave or I need you to ensure our privacy. Because I have to share with you some very, very, um, you know, top secret information, if you will. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, إِنَّمَا هُمَا إِبْنَتَايَا وَمَا ذَاكَ فِدَاكَ أَبِي وَأُمِّي يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He said that, O Messenger of Allah, the only other two people in the home are these two daughters of mine that you see right here, who obviously you can trust, and there's nobody else, so please tell me what's going on. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. What is going on? And the Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna Allah qada adina li fil khuruji wal hijra." Allah subhanahu wa taala has granted me the permission to leave Makkah and make the migration to Al Madinah to Al Munawwara. Now I want you to appreciate this moment. The Prophet ﷺ proclaims this, and you got to understand this is a huge moment. This is something everyone's been waiting for, been praying for, been asking for, been worried about. When well, because the Prophet, we talked about this in the previous narration, there's no Muslims left in Makkah. Some of the narrations mentioned that aside from whoever was held captive, and a few women and children, the men that remained in Makkah were pretty much the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr and Ali. radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. There was nobody else. And so they've been waiting. So the Prophet ﷺ proclaims, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَذِنَ لِي Allah has given me permission. فِي الْخُرُوجِ وَالْهِجْرَةِ and look what Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَقَالَ أَبُو بَكَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ أَصُحْبَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَصُحْبَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ He says that, Will I have the honor of accompanying you, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَصُحْبَ Yes, you will accompany me. Before I even go forward, because again, I want you to appreciate the gravity of this, 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 this honor. This dignity, this virtue bestowed upon Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And we were going to read later on. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, has that very famous statement where he says that I would trade all of the deeds. I would trade all of the deeds of Alu Umar. I would trade all of the deeds of the entire family of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Not just my own deeds, but my entire family, extended family. I would trade all those deeds in exchange for one day and one night of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he talks about how one of those occasions was when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left for the hijrah. It was Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu who accompanied the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this is what a great honor it was. So Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu immediately, you know, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says that when he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, As-suhbah ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, As-suhbah. Yes, you may accompany. She says, Qalat. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, She said, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا شَعَرْتُ قَدْتُ قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمْ أَنَّ أَحَدًا يَبْكِ مِنَ الْفَرْحِ حَتَّى رَأَيْتُ أَبَا بَكْرٍ يَوْمَ إِذٍ يَبْكِ She says, I swear to Allah, I never believed before that day you know when you talk about somebody crying out of happiness? She said, I never believed that somebody could ever be so happy that they would cry. Until that day when I saw my father Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu cry out of happiness. That he would accompany the Prophet sallallahu on this uh, remarkable journey. On this momentous 
occasion. So immediately Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, O Messenger of Allah, inna hataini rahilatani kuntu a'adtu lahuma, a'adtu huma lihada. He said that, O Messenger of Allah, here are two animals. He immediately sends word to the servant who brings the two camels. He says, O Messenger of Allah, I've got these two rides ready to go. I prepared them from before. And he, he says that I even hired a man to guide us and to lead us on the way. And he's bringing them now, he's got everything ready to go, and he's bringing them now. One of the narrations says that the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu that I will pay for my transportation. I will pay for my transportation. And of course, you can imagine, right, we, we, we take out, you know, a friend or a relative or the imam or a shaykh or somebody like that, we take them out for dinner or for lunch and they try to pay we're, we're offended. We're like, no, 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 no. This is a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala has got everything ready. And the Prophet is saying, Abu Bakr, how much did it cost? Tell me. Now this is what a predicament this is, right? Because on one side, you want to you wanna serve the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you don't want him to pay for it. And on the other side, you have sami'na wa ta'na. So he says, how much did it cost? I am going to pay for it. So <laughs> rock in a hard place, right? One side, you don't want to say anything, you want to say no, you cannot pay for it. But then how do you say no to Rasulullah ﷺ? So Abu Bakr ta'ala is trapped and he's like, Oh Messenger of Allah, please, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ is like, no, you be quiet, you tell me. How much does this cost? I'm going to pay for my own transportation. We're going in the path of Allah, we're doing hijrah, migration. This is something that will change the course of humanity. I'm paying for my own ride. You see the honor, the dignity of the Prophet ﷺ in this. And you see the khidmah of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu in this. It's such an unbelievable occasion. And so the Prophet sallallahu pays for his own transportation, his own ride. And the narration then goes on to say that they snuck out from the back. Ata Aba Bakr ibn Abi Qahafa fakharaja min khawqatin li Abi Bakr fi dhahri baytihi. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu had kind of like a small back door, a back entrance in his home. And they snuck out from there, they got the animals, and they went on their way. One of the narrations mentions, and this is the stuff I always like to highlight because it shows practical spirituality. I oftentimes talk to my students about practical spirituality. We talk about spirituality quite often, but we talk about it in a very... Um, you know, ambiguous, weird, complicated form. But a practical form of spirituality is what? That salah, that dhikr, that dua, Qur'an. It's, an, it's a practical part of your everyday life. It has a practical function in your life. So one the narration mentions that بَلَغَنِي أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَمَّا خَرَجَ مِن مَكَّةٍ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ يُرِيدُ الْمَدِينَةِ That when the Prophet ﷺ set out from Mecca towards Medina, they got on their transportation, they're on their way. قَالَ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي وَلَمْ أَكُوْ شَيْئًا The Prophet ﷺ is making dua here. He says, أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي وَلَمْ أَكُوْ شَيْئًا That all the ultimate praises for Allah who created me and I was nothing. I didn't exist before Allah created me. Allahumma inni ala hawli dunya wa bawaiqi dahri wa masaib al layali wal ayyami. He said, Oh Allah, help me in the face of the challenges of this world, the different trials and tribulations of time, the different uh, difficulties or adversities that present themselves, whether it be in night or in day. Allahumma ishabni fi safari. O oh Allah, accompany me on my journey. Wa khlufni fi ahli. And O oh Allah, look after my family in my absence. Wa barikli fi ma razaqtani. And O oh Allah, put blessing and barakah in whatever you have provided for me. Wa laka fadhalilni. And O oh Allah, allow me to submit. Make me submit to you alone, O oh Allah. وَعَلَى صَالِحِ خُلُقِي فَقَوِّمْنِي And oh Allah, establish me on the best of character, the best of akhlaq. The type of akhlaq that helps to solve problems, not the type of character that creates more problems. وَإِلَيْكَ رَبِّ فَحَبِّبْنِي And oh Allah, make me beloved to you, O oh Allah. وَإِلَى النَّاسِ فَلَا تَكِلْنِي And oh Allah, do not surrender me to the, to the, to the merciless people. رَبُّ الْمُسْتَضَعَفِينَ أَنْتَ وَأَنْتَ رَبِّي Oh Allah, you are the Lord of the weak, the oppressed, the downtrodden, and you are my Lord and my Master. أَعُوذُ بِوَجْهِكَ الْكَرِيمِ الَّذِي أَشْرَقَتْ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ 
I seek refuge in your noble face, O Allah. I take refuge, I take protection in your noble face that removes, that illuminates the heavens and the earth. وَكُشِفَتْ بِهِ الظُّلُمَاتُ And all the darknesses are dispelled by it. وَصَلَحَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ And O Allah, the, the, the light of your face solves the problems of the early and the, the people who came before and the people that will come after. أَنْتَ حُلَّ عَلَيَّ غَضَبَكَ Protect me from your anger or wrath ever descending upon me وَتُنْزِلَ بِيَ سَخَطَكَ and protect me from you ever sending your punishment upon me أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ زَوَالِ نِعْمَتِكَ I take protection with you Allah from your blessings ever running out وَفَجْأَةِ نِقْمَتِكَ and from your punishment coming and all of a sudden taking a hold of me وَتَحَوُّلِ عَافِيَتِكَ and from your protection leaving me وَجَمِيعِ سَخَطِكَ and from all types of your anger or your displeasure لَكَ الْعُتْبَى عِنْدِي خَيْرًا مَسْتَطَعْتُ I will continue to serve you to the best of my ability O Allah وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِكَ and there is no ability to do good and there is no strength to resist evil except through you by means of you through your blessing your mercy and your permission of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ makes this powerful dua while they're riding the animal and they're traveling on their way. So the narration mentions, before I actually talk about the next part of it, now they leave their home. They leave the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And they're on their way out of Mecca. What happens back in Mecca now? I told you that today's session was not just about the virtues of Abu Bakr, but it was about the virtues of his family. Specifically, we know the virtues of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we oftentimes forget about the virtues of Asma bin Tabi Bakr, her older sister Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha. So what's happening back at the home of Abu Bakr? Abu Jahl, as soon as they barge into the home of the Prophet ﷺ and they find him not there, they know where's the next place to look? Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu's home. So Abu Jahl with some people rushes over to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Knocks at the door. Asma bin Tabi Bakr, young girl, she opens the door. And he says, where is your father? Aina, Aina Abu Bakr. Aina Abu Bakr, where is your father? Tell me, Aina Abu Ka Abu Bakr. And she responds to him by saying, I don't know. They left and I don't know where they're at. And the narration says that Asma bin Tabi Bakr narrates this herself. So you can imagine. فَرَافَعَ Abu Jahal yadahu. She says that Abu Jahal lifted up his hand. وَكَانَ فَاحِشًا خَبِيثًا she said he was a very like shameless, like just terrible man. He was a terrible person, Abu Jahal. She says, فَلَطَمَ خَدِّي لَطْمَةً طَرِحَ مِنِّي قُرْتِي She said that he lifted up his hand and he slapped me as hard as he could on my face. He slapped me as hard as he could on my face to the point where I fell down. But she says, I, I looked at him straight in the eyes and I said, I'm not going to tell you anything. This is the strength of that family. This is the tarbiyah of a father like Abu Bakr creates a daughter like Asma. Another narration, follow up to that. Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates this herself. Her son narrates it from her. He says that, لَمَّا خَرَجَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ سَلَمْ وَخَرَجَ أَبُو بَكَرْ مَعَهُ إِحْتَمَلَ أَبُو بَكَرْ مَا لَهُ كُلَّهُ مَعَهُ Again, who is Abu Bakr? Asma, the daughter says that when, the, when my father Abu Bakr left with the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered up whatever money we had left. All, every last penny that we had left, he gathered all of it up and took it with him. Why? Because he said that we might end up needing it. The Prophet ﷺ, we might need it for the deen, we might need it for Rasulullah ﷺ. So he took every last penny and she says, خَمْسَةُ أَلَافِ دِرْهَمْ أَوْ سِتَّةُ أَلَافِ دِرْهَمْ She said it was either five or six thousand darahim. Five, six thousand dollars, whatever you want to consider it. She said, whatever money was left, he took it and he left with the Prophet ﷺ. فَدَخَلَ عَلَيْنَا جَدِّي أَبُو قُحَافَ وَقَدْ ذَهَبَ بَصَرُهُ She says a little while later, after Abu Jahl had come and made his little interrogation, and, and, and you know, slapped me, and he left, a little while later, my, by the time the news spread, my grandfather came, Abu Quhafa. He would become Muslim later in Fatu Makkah. 
So he would become Muslim seven, eight years later. He's not a Muslim right now. And she says he was already blind at this point. He was a very old man. In the narration about Fatu Makkah where he accepts Islam, it describes him where all of his hair is white, even his eyebrows, his eyelashes, everything is white. Such an old man. And he's blind at this point. His vision's gone because of his old age. So he comes to the home and he says, children, are you here? Is everything okay? And we say, yes, grandfather, we're here. Everything's fine. She doesn't complain. Abu Jahl did this, Abu Jahl. And she's like, no. We make sacrifices for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the deen of Allah. We don't need to complain to anybody else. I mean, look at the attitude, the mindset of these people. They embraced the opportunity to be able to sacrifice. So... He then says, "Wallahi inni la arahu qada fajaakum bi malihi ma nafsihi." He says, "Your father left, and if I know him, what I've seen from him these last thirteen years, he probably took all of his money, didn't he? Left you high and dry, didn't he?" Even though Asma radiAllahu taala anha did not mind, she said, "You know, he didn't. Grandfather, I don't blame him. He can't understand that we had Allah. We have Allah." But how do I help this old blind man understand? So I, I, I realize he's just worried and he's very old and he won't really even understand everything. So he's just angry, he's complaining, he probably took all of his money, left you high and dry here. So she says, قَالَتْ قُلْتُ كَلَّا يَا أَبَتِي كَلَّا يَا أَبَتِي Absolutely not grandfather. إِنَّهُ قَدْ تَرَكَ لَنَا خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا SubhanAllah. Look at what she even says, she doesn't say مَالًا كَثِيرًا she said, إِنَّهُ قَدْ تَرَكَ لَنَا خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا He's left a lot of good things for us. He's left a lot of good for us, meaning iman. Allah, the love of Allah, the love of His Rasul, the love of the book of Allah. He's left all of that for us. But she uses language where she says, He's left a lot of good for us. A lot of good stuff for us. So the grandfather understands it however he understands it. And then she says, قَالَتْ وَأَخَذْتُ أَحْجَارًا فَوَضَعْتُهَا فِي كُوَّةٍ فِي الْبَيْتِ She said, I took a big tray that we had in the house, and I filled it up with a bunch of rocks. وَكَانَ أَبِي يَضَعُهُ مَا لَهُ فِيهَا And normally Abu Bakr ta'ala used to put the money in this tray. It was kind of like a little basket or a tray. And he would put the money in there like the darahim. So you know, they'd be pieces of gold and silver. So she says, I took a bunch of rocks and pebbles, I spread them out into that dish. ثُمَّ وَضَعْتُ عَلَيْهَا ثَوْبًا Then I covered it up with a cloth, because that's what we would do to keep it kind of out of sight. We'd cover it up with a cloth. So I covered it up with a cloth. ثُمَّ أَخَذْتُ بِيَدِهِ So then I took the hand of my grandfather and I placed it onto this dish with these rocks covered with a cloth. فَقُلْتُ يَا أَبَتِي ضَعْ يَدَكَ عَلَى هَذَا الْمَالِ She said, grandfather, look at this. Look at all of this. And I put his hand there on the tray and he moved his hand around and he said, لَا بَأْسَ إِذَا كَانَ تَرَكَ لَكُمْ هَذَا فَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ Then he goes, oh, then it's no problem. You got plenty over here. Oh, no, don't worry. You got plenty over here. How easy would it have been for a girl? For a little girl, a young child to complain, we don't have anything, we don't know what to do. But this was the iman of these people. This was the iman of these people. I really hate to rant and rave about this. And my, my intention is not to offend. But we have 18 year old young men today, strapping young men. They get a flat tire, they don't know what to do. Mommy, I have flat tire, what do I do? Right? I mean, it's ajeeb. Like even the perspective, I'm, I'm very honestly, like this, this, it was a different mindset. It was a different culture. This is a young woman of Iman. Look at her faith. Look at her Iman. Unbelievable. Single-handedly holding down the fort. Standing up to a tyrant. The Prophet ﷺ, it's a weak narration. I've shared with it here in the Sira podcast before. Where the Prophet ﷺ says, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فِرْعَوْنَ وَفِرْعَوْنَ أُمَّةِ أَبُو جَهَلْ Abu Jahl is a Fir'aun. He's a young woman of Iman. She stands up to a tyrant. Takes a slap in the face and doesn't flinch. Defends the honor of her father in the service of the deen. Unbelievable family, unbelievable iman. And so, while all of this is going on, on the other side, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the Prophet arrive at the ghar of Thawr. Alright, so they arrive there at Thumma Amada ila ghar bi Thawr. Jabalin bi asfali Makkah. 
This was a mountain off to the side of Mecca. And they basically go and they stop there. Now there was the, 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 the young man who Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala had hired as a guide who took them there. When they reached the cave, they found this small little cave and they went inside of there. They told that young man, you take the camels and you go. And you come back a few days later when the coast is clear. Because they found out obviously these people are going to come out looking for us. There's going to be entire search parties. And on top of that, Abu Jahal and some other leaders of Quraysh put a bounty on their heads, a hundred camels, whoever brings them back dead or alive. So they said, we're going to, we're going to hide out in this cave till kind of it, you know, it, it calms down, it cools off a little bit. So you take these camels and you go away and you come back after a few days. We'll get the word to you. In the meantime, there were two other individuals who played a critical role. There was the son of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala. Of course, who else would you expect here, right? So you already seen father in action, daughter in action. So now the son is not too far behind either. Abdullah bin Abi Bakr. Abdullah bin Abi Bakr. Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was appointed by his father Abu Bakr that his job was to spend all day in Mecca and to move around. Young man, you know, so just walk around town, interact with people, socialize, go here, go there, sit down here, sit down there, just kind of move around. And, and يتسمع, and listen to what people are talking about. What's going on? Who's looking? Who's not looking? Have they put a bounty? Have they not put a bounty? Where are they looking? Why are they looking? Where are they going? What do they know? What do they not know? Like keep, keep an ear to the ground. And come every night, and when he would come every night, he would bring food for them. He would bring food for them, and then he would come every night, he would spend every night there in the cave with them. He would fill them in on all the happenings in Mecca, inform them, and then he would, so he would come late at night after everyone had gone to sleep. And again, appreciate the fact that we're talking about Arabia, 1400 years ago. There's no lights, there's no flashlight, there's nothing like that. And he travels out, leaves Mecca after everyone's gone into their homes and gone to sleep. And then he walks in the dark, into the mountains, which could be very dangerous. There used to be wild dogs and all different types of things out there. He walks, snakes and everything. He walks all the way there, goes to the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, brings them food, spends the night there with them, you know, um, fills them in on all the happenings in Mecca. And then before daybreak, before in the morning, again in the darkness of the night, he leaves there again and gets back into his home. So nobody realizes that he was even gone. And the son of Abu Bakr, Abdullah, the son of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala who does this for three days. The other individual, so this is the night shift. During the daytime, there is Amr bin Fuhayra. Amr bin Fuhayra was, had a, was related to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, and some narrations mention that he was like a freed slave of the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Nevertheless, he had a connection. He had a very close relationship with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he would later on, you know, accept Islam, become Muslim, or either he was already Muslim at this particular point. But nevertheless, he would be shaheed later in the incident of Bi'r Ma'una, which we'll talk about a little bit later. He used to work as a shepherd. He used to work as a shepherd. So he had sheep and goats and things like that. And he used to work as a shepherd amongst all the other shepherds. So what he would do is, and they, the, the place that they would shepherd was not far from the cave of Thawr. So it was the perfect cover. So he would spend the day there shepherding and kind of like kind of walk off a little bit, tell everybody, I'm going to take some of the flock and I'm just going to walk around, look for some more, you know, patches of grass or leaves or trees or whatever. And he would kind of wander off and he would go by the cave of Thawr. Very quietly, very stealthily, he would go there and then they would actually take one of the animals or one of the sheep or the goats and he would milk the animal for the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and spend the day there with them. And then he would again depart from there, you know, in the evening time when all the shepherds would be leaving, he would rejoin them and go back to Mecca with them. And then at night time, of course, the son of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu would go. And this is basically what went on for three days there in the cave of Thor. Now, it talks about even on their way to the cave of Thor, continuing on with the virtues of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that as they were walking to the cave of Thor, as they were walking to the cave of Thor, when they left Mecca, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is riding behind the Prophet like he's traveling behind the Prophet 
But then he would move up in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Then a little while later, he'd move back behind the Prophet ﷺ. Some narrations say he'd come to the left, then he'd go to the front, then he'd come over to the right, then he'd go back to the back again. And he just kind of kept going around like this around the Prophet ﷺ. And after a couple of times, it's very odd behavior, like why are you just circling around me? What's going on over here? So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, Ya Baba, is everything okay? Like, what are you doing? And he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I'm nervous, I'm worried. And I keep thinking, somebody's gonna try to attack us from behind. Somebody's gonna ride up behind us. So then I get behind you. So if they launch an arrow or do anything, it'll get me first. And then all of a sudden it occurs to me that, wait, 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 wait. What if somebody's already waiting to ambush us? So then what I do is I ride out in front of you to be able to catch anything that'll come at you from the front. And I'm just worried, Ya Rasulullah. And he kept going around the Prophet ﷺ like this. Like imagine the level of devotion, love that this person has for the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Then when they reach the cave, when they finally come to the cave of Thawr and they figure this is the perfect place for us to kind of hide out for a little bit, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala tells the Prophet ﷺ, please wait here, Ya Rasulullah. And he goes inside. And the narration describes that he goes around with his hand. With his hands. Because it's dark inside the cave. So you can't really even see. So he goes inside the cave and with his hands, he covers every inch of the cave, wiping around with it with his hands. And again the Prophet ﷺ asks him, What are you doing, Ya Abu Bakr? What are you doing? One of the most intelligent people I've ever known, and now you're just acting bizarre ever since we left Makkah. What are you doing? And he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, it's a small little cave. Nobody's here. It's really dark inside. I'm worried that there might be like some snakes or scorpions or something harmful. So I was wiping around with my hands. So that way I would know, I would find out if there was anything harmful inside the cave, Ya Rasulullah. Can you see the love that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu has for the Prophet And so then he asked the Prophet ﷺ, come on inside. And they sit down inside of the cave and they stay inside of the cave and they're reading and they're making dua and they're sitting there and resting there and spending their day there. Now there's a very, and I'm probably gonna end up stopping here, but there's a very interesting, you know, little bit, there's an interesting narrative about the cave. I was actually talking about this with the, the, the Qalam Seminary students. We were covering this chapter in the classical Sira text we were reading. So I was, we were talking about this today. There's an interesting little narrative about the cave. That when the Prophet ﷺ went inside with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and by the second, third day when the Quraysh actually were now in that area, scoping that area out, covering that area, that there are a few different collection of different narrations. Some narrations mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a tree, like miraculously a tree sprouted out, out of the ground and covered the mouth, the opening of the cave over. Just grew out instantaneously and covered the opening of the grave. Another narration says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a couple of pigeons there. And they like again instantly like built a nest, laid eggs right there in front of the cave. At the mouth of the cave. Another narration mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent spiders there to like spin a spider web. Some narrations mention that some lizards and stuff like that came there and were crawling around like insects and lizards and stuff like that were crawling around in front of there. Where again typically nobody has kind of cleaned up or passed through for a while. So now imagine there's like tree branches growing out in front of it, pigeons and nests and you know spider webs and insects and all of this is there. And so before I tell you something interesting about just the authenticity of these narrations, so that particular narration mentions that when they were in that area, one of the young men who was part of this, 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 uh, these bounty hunters, who are looking for the Prophet ﷺ, one of them, they tell them, go check over there, I think there's a cave over there. Go, you look over there. And he comes up to the cave, and this is the moment where Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala gets frightened. And the narration says the Prophet ﷺ is praying, making dua, just completely, just connected to Allah. Like there's nobody else even here. Nothing else is going on, not a worry in the world. There, nothing could trouble him in the least bit. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is sweating and he even says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Ya Rasulullah, I'm like, ha- I'm like having trouble not making noise, like just breathing hard and panting, like I'm, you know, hyperventilating, I'm having a panic attack. 
Why not for himself? But Ya Rasulullah, if they see you, then, then what am I going to do? So he's worried for the safety of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is that occasion, this is that moment where the Prophet of Allah ﷺ places his hand on the hand of Abu Bakr to kind of calm, calm him down, places a hand on his shoulder. The narration says, and the Prophet of Allah ﷺ tells him, ما ظنك بإثنين الله ثالثهما لا تحزن إن الله معنا He says, يا أبا بكر ما ظنك بإثنين الله ثالثهما Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think would happen to two travelers that Allah is their third companion on their journey? What could happen to them? What could happen to them? لا تحزن إن الله معنا Don't you dare worry about a single thing. Allah is with us. And the narration mentions the ayat of the Qur'an that are mentioned in Surah Al-Anfal where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or excuse me, the, the ayat that are mentioned in Surah Al-Tawbah Surah Al-Tawbah, excuse me Surah Al-Tawbah, ayah number 40 إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدَ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ that, Allah, that you help the Messenger of Allah Allah is telling the believers, help the Messenger of Allah, like Allah helped His Messenger. إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا When those who disbelieved ousted him from his own home, his own land, his own place. كَفَرُوا إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ That there was a second travel companion with the Prophet ﷺ. It was the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ They were both in the cave. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ The Prophet ﷺ turns to his travel companion, Abu Bakr ta'ala anhu, لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا He says, don't you dare worry about anything, because Allah is with us. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his peace and his tranquility upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped him with an army that you could not see. He helped him through an invisible army. لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُّفْلَى وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowered the word, the mission, the cause of those who disbelieved in Allah, disbelieved in Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated the cause, the word, the call, the mission, the message of those who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dominant, mighty, and powerful, and wise. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calms the nerves of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he says, don't you dare worry about a thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look out for us. So I was telling you this young man from that scouting party, from those bounty hunters comes over here and he sees, and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu sees him coming closer and he starts to really panic. And the Prophet sallallahu puts an arm on his shoulder and he says, don't you dare worry about a thing, Allah is with us. And this young man, he's still like quite a bit of a distance. The narration mentions like 40, 50 yards away from the opening of the cave. And he looks at it and he sees, you know, all the miraculously what had appeared at the mouth of the cave. He looks at all of it and he turns around and he goes back. And the narration says the Prophet ﷺ can hear their conversation inside the cave. That when he goes back to the people, they're like, Hey, hey, did you check out that cave? And he's like, nah man, there's nothing over there. There's nothing over there. There's nothing over there. Look at it. And they just walk right away from there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them. Now what I was going to share with you, something interesting about the authenticity of these exact narrations, there's a lot of discussion about the authenticity of this, these exact particular narrations. The ones I mentioned, you know, pigeons and birds' nests and eggs and spider webs and trees and it mentions all of this. There's a lot of issues, there are some issues in regards to a lot of these different narrations. But the scholars of the seerah, they actually summarized the point by, this, by saying that even though a lot of the exact particular narrations, maybe they were a little bit, you know, hyperbolized and exaggerated, like, you know, and beautified. And there's actually some poems that are even narrated that, you know, throughout history, some people even had poems. Nasjuda wuda ma hama sahib al ghari wa kana al fakharu lil an kabuti fa gama alayhi al an kabutu bi nashihi wa dalla ala al bab al hamamu yabidu. That it, there are all these poems talking about that what great honor there is for the spider to protect the messenger of Allah. And imagine the spider laying its 
its web and the pigeon putting its eggs in front of the door of the cave, etc., etc. So this was something that was probably a little bit, you know, hyperbolized and exaggerated for the purpose of telling of the story. So while the exact particular narrations are not completely authenticated, but the scholars of the seerah say that overwhelmingly, we do know for a fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided. And the ayah of the Qur'an says, وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا Allah helped the Prophet ﷺ with an army that you couldn't see coming. So we can know this much for a fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did miraculously cover, shroud, protect the Prophet ﷺ and his travel companion Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the cave of Thawr on that day of the migration in the hijrah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from the eyes of the mushrikun, the kuffar, those who were coming after them. And basically where we'll pick up from here is when the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu finally now they leave the cave they call for their rides back the rides are provided for them and they leave the cave and they now set out on their way towards al Madina to Munawara and again the miraculous events continue to happen continue to unfold and we'll talk about some of these miraculous events in the actual journey and their arrival into the illuminated blessed city of Medina or actually first they arrive in the suburb of Medina the city of Quba the people of Quba they first arrive there people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised in the Quran in the book of Allah so we'll talk about that inshallah in the next following session may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that we've said and heard again I mentioned this at the beginning I want to mention conclude with this again when you read about these people they, they, these are the people that we look up to these are our role models these this is the legacy of these people this is our spiritual heritage that we have inherited that we are beneficiaries of we are spiritually the inheritors of great men and great people, great men and women like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And what we have to ask ourselves is what have we done in the service of the deen? What have we done? You know, and it's not a matter of just simply shame. My purpose of mentioning that, and I'm talking to myself, not to anybody else, I'm talking to myself. The purpose here is not to shame ourselves. We're worthless, we're filthy, we're, we haven't done anything, we're garbage. No, no, that's not, that's not the purpose of this, this discussion. But the purpose is to read about these people, learn about these people. These are the people we need to know about. These are the people we have to educate our children about. These are the people that we should have discussions at home, in the family. Our children need to know, deserve to know. It is their right for them to know. Who is Abu Bakr and who is Asma bint Abi Bakr? Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. And then secondly, when we talk about them, we read about them, we learn about them, use that as a marker. That is the standard, that is the bar. And be inspired by the example of these people. And let's take a look. You know, from, uh, motivation is very important. But every now and then, every now and then it's important to look in the mirror, to, to take a long, hard, serious look in the mirror, and gauge ourselves and measure ourselves. Where do I stand? Where do we stand? What have I done for the deen of Allah? And inshallah, hopefully this motivates us to take our opportunity, the opportunity that we have to serve the deen of Allah, to take it a little bit more seriously. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natawwilayhi.